the last lesson, we derived the differential momentum, momentum equation, um, the most general form involving shear stresses and normal stresses, uh, acceleration, gravitational force. Um, but as mentioned in that lesson, this is not always the best form to use these equations in. And so today, we're going to derive a uh, slightly different form. So I'm trying to change some of these stresses into other quantities that are more easily measured, like velocities and pressures. And then from there, we'll actually solve these equations. So to do this, we're going to assume that the fluid is Newtonian. Remember that a Newtonian fluid is one where the viscous stress is proportional to the strain rate. And so we've had equations for shear stress, um, tau xy, that look like uh, dvx dy times mu. Um, now, of course, that was only taking account one direction of velocity. Now that I can have velocity in all three directions, um, tau xy um, is also tau yx takes into account both directions, so I have dvx dy and dvy dx, of course multiplied by mu. Similarly for the other directions, tau xz, tau zx, same thing, dvx dz, dvz dx, both of them multiplied by mu, and so on. So those are my shear stresses. I've now related those to velocities, which are already in my equation, so that helps basically eliminate one of my variables, the shear stresses. And similarly for the normal stresses, my normal stresses are related to um, any pressure. So pressure is a normal stress. Um, any velocity hitting that surface is going to cause a stress. So that's what these other terms are for. Uh, dvx dx coming in um, on the x face in the x direction. So I have some pressure or some normal stress um, from that guy. And so I have those as my normal stresses, again, related to velocity and pressure. So I'm, I haven't really eliminated um, variables. I've eliminated components, x, y, and z and related it just to pressure and velocity. And the other thing I'm going to do when I plug these back into the previous equations is I'm also going to assume that the fluid's incompressible. So assuming the fluid's incompressible, I know that the divergence of velocity is zero. So this term and all three of those is going to go away. So I'm going to plug in those sigmas, these taus, um, into the previous equations and get a better version of the general momentum equation. Plugging those in, we get the navier stokes equations in component form. So I have x component rho, um, this x component, because all my top variables are all vx. Um, y component, top variables are all vy. z component, again, top variables are all vz. So I again have my acceleration term, which is the same as before. Then on the right hand side, I have gravity in the x direction minus gradient of pressure dp dx plus viscosity mu, then d squared, vx dx squared, vx dy squared, vx dz squared, and similarly for the other um, y and z components. And so these are the equations that we're going to use um, to actually solve the momentum equation. A shorter way to write those equations is in vector form. So instead of having three components, I can write them all as a vector. So I can take my velocity, turn it into a vector. Um, Another shorthand way to write this is this capital DV by capital DT. So this capital D means the substantial derivative. Substantial derivative is just defined to be the time derivative plus V dot of the gradient times my velocity. So this D by DT is just defined to be that guy. Um, again, shorthand way to write all that stuff. Then right hand side, I have gravitational force, gradient under pressure, and mu del squared V. The nice thing about this vector form is that it doesn't matter what coordinate system you're in, it works for all of them. So in the XYZ case that we just saw, this equation reduces to, or expands out to, the three equations that we saw before. In other coordinate systems, it's going to do the same thing. The problem is you need to be careful with um, these um, vectors, um, the gradient, um, divergence, um, up, upside down triangle squared, things of that nature have kind of silly not necessarily silly, but in a, um, weird forms that um, are not kind of what you're used to. For example, my divergence of velocity is um, just dx, dy, and dz. Um, gradient is just dx in the x direction, dy in the y direction, dz in the z direction. But in cylindrical coordinates, for example, I have dp dr in the r direction, but then 1 over r, dp d theta in the theta direction, and dp dz in the z direction. Um, this is kind of the simplest change. The other ones get a lot worse. Um, 
So be careful with those if you use any other coordinate systems. For instance, using all the proper uh, variations of those vector derivatives, the Navier-Stokes equations in cylindrical coordinates uh, look like this. So you may have noticed that these equations are fairly long and complicated, and so to actually solve them, um, we're not going to solve the entire thing. No one's actually ever solved the entire um, full equations. So what we need to do is make our lives easier uh, by making them simpler equations, and then we're going to solve those. So the general procedure to do that is first thing we start with um, the full long equations. Um, in whatever coordinate system we're dealing with. So if we have some sort of cylindrical geometry, we want to use a cylindrical version. If we're using standard x, y, and z, um, we want to use the standard x, y, and z component equations, uh, these guys here. Now that we have the starting point, uh, again, we want to make those equations a lot simpler. So we want to uh, make a bunch of assumptions um, to get rid of a bunch of terms. Uh, for example, if I have flow in only one direction, each one of those three equations corresponds to a flow in one direction. So if I only have it in the y direction, for example, that's the only equation I need. I can get rid of the x equation and the z equation. So things of that nature um, reduce my equations down to uh, much smaller equations. Then once I have those smaller equations, I want to solve them. Um, and that generally just involves integration uh, and using boundary conditions. So usually there's some sort of solid object in the way. And I know that fluid velocity at any solid object um, is going to be the same as that solid object. So if the solid object is stationary, no slip condition, no penetration condition, um, my velocity is generally going to be zero at that location. So what are these assumptions that we're going to make to make the equation easier? Generally, they're things that are stated in the problem. That the problem will say the fluid is incompressible, for example. Um, so if the fluid is incompressible, that means that the density doesn't change. How that helps us mathematically is that the divergence of velocity is zero. And so the question is, when can we use this um, assumption? And usually, you can use the assumption whenever the problem says it is. Um, so in this case, if the problem says it's incompressible, I can use the incompressible assumption. But for this particular one, uh, we actually used incompressibility to derive Navier-Stokes. And so we've actually already used it, whether they tell it's, it's incompressible or not. So we've already kind of used it. So this guy has already been used. So um, it's already in there. doesn't really help us at all at this point. Um, the next assumption that can be made is if the flow is steady. If the flow is steady, that means there's no time dependence. So the flow is going to look the same whether I look at it now or whether I look at it in an hour from now. Nothing's going to change. So no time dependence um, means that the time derivative goes to zero. So the first term on the left-hand side of all my um, Navier-Stokes equations, each component has a d by dt term. So that's going to go away if the flow is steady. And this guy, um, generally, if the problem states, they'll, they'll tell you. Uh, you can assume it's steady. Um, sometimes it doesn't necessarily state it, but you can kind of imply it based on the scenario. So based on what's actually happening in the problem, you can look at it and say, well, you know, this is going to happen and for a very long time. Um, things are going to end up at a steady state. Things are going to end up doing this same thing. Um, and so in that case, get rid of those time derivatives. So the next assumption is called fully developed. Fully developed means there's no variation in the direction of motion. So a lot of times, as I said, in the Navier-Stokes equations, they reduce down to one single uh, velocity in one direction. So I can take it down and only have velocity, for example, in the x direction. It means there's no variation in that direction. Um, so it kind of means if I have flow in the x direction, I look at this point here. I look at some point later down the the flow in x. Um, if everything here looks the same as everything over there, then there's no variation. So no variation in that direction means it is fully developed. Uh, this happens a lot with things like really long pipes. Really long pipes, um, the flow inside your pipe looks the same um, no matter where you are. So that would be a fully developed case. Um, mathematically, the way this works is, again, um, direction of motion. So I've kind of assumed here z is my direction of motion. So any derivative in that direction z would be zero. I call this d by dz question mark because the question mark means um, it depends on which way the flow is going. If the flow is going in the x direction, this would be d by dx. If the flow is going by the y direction, this would be d by dy. So that's why the question mark's there. It's not necessarily z. It's whatever direction um, you're left over with for your Navier-Stokes equations when you do the geometry. 
you break it down to one velocity, that direction is the one you care about. Um, one big exception to this is that there's a dp dz term on the right hand side of the equations. That guy does not necessarily go away if the flow is fully developed. So even if I have a fully developed flow in the z direction, um, this guy may need to stick around. We'll talk about him next. Um, to use the fully developed assumption, it's usually going to be stated in the problem, so the problem will say it's fully developed. Um, it could also be implied, and the way this is implied is if you have uh, something that's very, very long in the direction of motion. So like I said, if I have a really, really long pipe in the x direction, um, then because it's really, really long, eventually things will start looking the same. So um, if the fluid is infinite, that's um, another way, or if you're really, or even very, very long, that's another way that this assumption can be applied. So regarding that pressure term, uh, dp dz, or dp dx, or dp dy, um, generally if the pressure, external pressure in the problem is constant, um, any derivative of a constant is zero. So if you have constant pressure, these guys all go to zero. And generally what happens in these problems is it doesn't tell you that the pressure is constant, it only tells you when the pressure is not constant. So generally anytime a problem references pressure is to tell you that it's not constant and that's when you need to possibly worry about these guys. So generally, if the word pressure is not anywhere in the question statement, um, it's generally safe to get rid of all of those guys. So that's how you deal with the pressure term. Um, again, be careful not to get rid of him when you do the fully developed assumption. Next assumption is if the fluid is inviscid. If the fluid is inviscid, it has zero viscosity. So in terms of zero viscosity, that means mu equals zero. So last term on the right hand side of all my equations in the Niagara Stokes equations had a mu times a bunch of stuff so if that was the case mu equals zero all that stuff goes away and the only time you can use this assumption is if the problem tells you the fluid's inviscid. So last but certainly not least useful assumption is what I like to call geometry. Um, this is also the hardest one because it requires you to kind of figure out based on the problem um, what you need to get rid of what you need to keep and so basically what you need to do is look at the question and you know ask yourself, is the fluid only going in one direction? Is the fluid only going in two directions? Can I get rid of um, an entire one of those component equations? So for example, if my fluid is two-dimensional, only on the board in x and y coordinates, then you can get rid of the entire z equation. Um, similarly, is there any variation in all three directions? So again, if I have that two-dimensional flow on the board, nothing's going to happen in the z direction. So I can get rid of z derivatives. Um, which way is gravity going? Because generally gravity will usually only go in one direction, x, y, or z. Um, sometimes it'll go in two, depending on the situation. But usually I can get rid of gravity in a lot of the equations. So as I said, this is kind of the toughest one because you need to figure out, based on the geometry of the problem, um, what to keep, what to um, throw away. But at the same time, it's the one that I like to use first because it gets rid of the most stuff. Um, if I have flow only in the x direction, so my velocity, only velocity is vx, dy and vz I can reason, reasonably assume to be zero, then I can get rid of two whole equations out of the three and only start with that one. So I would do this one first because it gets rid of the most stuff um, and then go on to other ones after that. There are other assumptions that are stated in the problem a lot of times. Um, the problem will tell you that the flow is laminar. Um, that actually doesn't help us at all in terms of reducing the equations. It's kind of like the incompressible uh, condition that we kind of needed it to get where we are. So the fact that flow is laminar um, is all well and good, but doesn't help us at all. I'll do an example of this. So I have a plate moving across a fluid thickness H, plate moving at velocity U. I want to know what the steady state motion of the fluid is. So solve for the fluid motion uh, based on this scenario. And when I solve this, um, I'm perfectly free to pick my own coordinate system. So I'm going to pick my coordinates to go x to the right, y go up, standard x, y coordinates. Doesn't actually matter which ones you choose. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. So to solve this guy, my first step is to start with my Navier Stokes equations um, in the proper coordinate system. I have x, y, z coordinates. So I want the Cartesian um, Navier Stokes equations. So these big guys here. And now my next step, I want to take my equations and make them a lot simpler, get rid of a lot of terms by using those assumptions we just talked about. 
um, to hopefully get them into a form that I can actually solve. So the first assumption to make is geometry. Um, with geometry, I can say, first thing I want to say is that based on this picture, um, my fluid is only going to move in the x direction. Um, if you don't believe me, I'm going to prove that to you in a minute. But right now, Vx is the only v velocity I care about. So Vy and Vz both equal zero. What that means is that I can cross out all these Vy's, all those Vz's. I've essentially got rid of the entire equations other than this little bit here. And this little bit, uh, if you look at it, um, that's basically just the definition of hydrostatic pressure going way back. So all that's telling me is that this pressure has hydrostatic pressure in it, which really doesn't tell me anything. So essentially, this part of the equation is relatively useless because what I'm trying to solve for is the fluid velocity. This has zero impact on the actual velocity because it's hydrostatic. Um, so because I care about the velocity, I really don't care about those terms that are left over. So I pretty much get rid of these entire two equations. And notice that I also have a Vy and a Vz in my x equation. So I can also get rid of those two terms there. So I stated that Vx is the only velocity I have. Vy and Vz are zero. So to prove that, uh, first thing I want to do is make the reasonable assumption that there's no velocity in the z direction. It's drawn as a two-dimensional flow. So there's really no reason to say that Vz is anything other than zero. So you can assume that Vz is zero, hopefully without too many um, arguments. And then to prove that Vy is also zero, um, I want to make use of the fact that the fluid is incompressible. Um, so if the fluid is incompressible, it means that divergence velocity is zero. In Cartesian coordinates, divergence velocity dvx dx, dvy dy, dvz dz equals zero. But I know that my velocity vz is zero, so I can get rid of that guy. And then the other thing um, from the question is that the um, fluid is or the flow is fully developed. I um, haven't actually got to that in the derivation yet, but we'll get there in a minute or two. And so because the fluid is fully developed, it's going in the x direction. So I can get rid of dv dx because any derivative in that fluid motion in the x direction should be zero as well. So that guy's gone as well. So all I'm left with is that dvy dy equals zero. If I integrate this with respect to y, um, Integral takes care of the derivative, so I'm left with just Vy on that side. Integral of zero, just some constant, call it C. And then what this tells me is that my Y velocity, no matter where I am in the fluid, has to be the same value, it's a constant. So it doesn't matter if I'm here, or there, or there, or there. It doesn't matter where I am, I have to have the same velocity. And I know what the velocity is at two points, um, based on my boundary conditions, um, the no penetration condition. So my velocity down here at Y equals zero, going through my floor um, has to be zero because I can't have a flow going through the floor. Similarly, the velocity cannot go through the plate, so my velocity at y equals h also has to be zero. So based on those two, or either one of those two, um, this constant has to be zero because dy has to be zero at those two points. Now because it's zero at those points and constant everywhere in the fluid, it has to be zero everywhere. So because my velocity is zero everywhere, dy is zero and I can go on and proceed with my um, example. My next assumption is again, because I have only x and y coordinates here, I can assume nothing happens in the z direction in and out of the board. So no variation in z means that all my derivatives with respect to z, um, d by dz, d squared um, also is going to be zero. So I get rid of, um, this term's already gone, but I could have got rid of it if it wasn't gone because I have a derivative with respect to z there. And then this guy over here, um, second derivative is also going to be gone. Now going back to the question, I can see that the um, question stated that the flow was steady. So because of that, um, I can get rid of the d by dt term. So this first term there goes away. Similarly, um, in the question also says it's fully developed. So infinite fluid means fully developed. And again, my velocity here is going to be in the x direction. So in terms of fully developed, it means that any variation in the x direction is going to be zero. So this guy, dv dx, is zero. And similarly, 
any second derivative is also going to be zero. So the second derivative over there is also zero. Now looking at what I'm left with, on the entire left hand side is all zero. I have a gravitational term, a pressure term, and this guy over here. Um, so what have I not taken into account yet? Um, going back to geometry, I forgot to look at um, gravity. So my gx is going to be zero. Um, if anything, there's only gravity in y based on the way I've drawn it, so no gravity in x. And then last thing, um, the problem did not say anything about pressure. So notice in when I did the fully developed, I did not get rid of the pressure, but because the um, question says nothing about any pressure variation, I can assume there is none. So basically, this guy's going to go away unless the problem says something about there being a pressure variation in that direction. Um, so the uh, question to say that, so I can assume that guy's gone, so this guy um, is gone as well. So basically all I'm left with, left hand side is zero, right hand side I'm left with one term, that guy there. So based on that, what I'm left with is zero equals mu d squared vx dy squared, um, or in this case I can just divide by mu um, and end up with just d squared vx dy squared equals zero. That's the equation I want to solve. So from that big, long, Navier Stokes, huge equations, this is all I'm left with. This is what I need to solve. So now last step, I want to actually solve this equation. The equation I have, d squared vx dy squared equals zero, generally involves integration. So integrate this guy um, twice. First integration with respect to y um, gets rid of one of these derivatives. So I'm left with only one derivative, dvx dy, integrate zero, I get a constant, some so are some arbitrary constant C1. Integrate again, so my derivative goes away. I'm left with just dx on the left-hand side. Right-hand side, C1 constant times y plus another arbitrary constant. And then to fully um, solve this problem, I need to know what my constants are, C1 and C2. And those are generally found through boundary conditions. Again, having uh, or knowing what my velocity is at certain points based on where it's in contact with solid objects. So I'm in contact with the solid object at y equals zero um, with the ground. Ground's not moving. So at y equals zero, my velocity should be zero. And then I contact with this plate up here, moving at some velocity, capital U to the right. So my velocity at y equals h for my fluid has to match that velocity, capital U, on top of the plate. So plugging these two conditions into my solution up here, plugging y equals zero, I have vx equals c2 but that vx has to be zero, so c2 has to be zero. And then plugging in y equals h to this equation, um, I have c1 times h, that velocity has to be capital U, so capital U is c1 times h, remember c2 is zero. So solving this, I get that c1 is capital U over h. So that means my solution to this problem, plug in c1 and c2 back into that equation for vx. vx is c1, u over h times y plus c2, which is zero. So that is my final solution for my velocity inside that fluid region, u over h times y. Um, linear profile, starting at zero at the bottom, going up to some velocity capital U at the top, and then again varying linear, linearly based on that equation in the middle.